Welcome, comadres and friends. Tonight we have another edition or presentation, I should say, for the Las Comadres Kitchen. We're always very honored and so happy to have with us our hostess, Lola Huarco Dweck, and from Lola's Cocina. And she has a beautiful program for us tonight. So I'm going to stop talking. Lola, it's all yours. Okay, just a really quick introduction for anyone who hasn't joined one of our classes from earlier this year. My name is Lola Wiarco Dweck, and I founded Lola's Cocina about 10 years ago, where I share a lot of family recipes and recipes inspired by Oaxaca, where I've conducted a lot of research. Um, and it's really just a way to honor my culture and my family's recipes. I love what I do. It ended up turning into from a hobby to uh, work for me where I work with different brands from throughout the country developing recipes for them. I teach cooking classes and then I have my online shop Lola's Mercadito and today the Comadres requested a class on holiday treats, edible treats for the holidays. What we put together tonight is something that is great for um, you know, for Christmas because it's coming up. I know a lot of people do cookie exchanges and are looking for different gifts to give to teachers, to coworkers, to friends that have a little bit more meaning than something that you can just buy off the shelves. So I think you're going to enjoy what, what we're going to be making. We're going to be making uh, a few different recipes and I'll go through them one by one after we go over some housekeeping items. My sister and comadre Elise from Las Vegas is joining us and she's going to be moderating. She's going to be asking some um, dropping some fun facts and asking some trivia questions throughout the class, so make sure you pay attention. Um, and she's just going to go over a few quick items before we get started cooking. Yeah, we just ask if you could please keep yourself on mute. It's really engaging if your camera's on, so if you feel comfortable putting your camera on so we could read facial expressions, see if you're snoozing, if we need to pick it up a little bit. And then feel free to unmute yourself to ask any questions or drop them in the chat. And again, like Lola announced, we're going to be giving away some prizes. So pay attention to the fun facts because we will be asking some trivia questions for prizes. Thank you. Okay, we are going to get started. I'm going to just give a brief overview about uh, over and discuss what we're going to be making. And then we're going to go into a little bit more depth as we start each recipe. So one item we're going to be making is a hibiscus syrup, which I always keep on hand in my refrigerator. I've kind of tried to show different ways to bedazzle them so that they look cute for gifting. And we're also going to be making some haystacks, which I had never heard of haystacks before until uh, I met my husband and started going to some of their family parties. It's something that my suegra makes for almost all of the holidays when we get together. Adults love them, kids love them. And those are made with the basic ingredients, chocolate, something crunchy, and marshmallows. So I have her her recipe for you guys. And then I also made a different, a little bit more, um, a, a spin on her recipe, which I use dark chocolate. And then I use cinnamon toast crunch for the crunch factor um, and then marshmallows. And one recipe that I make all the time, probably at least once a month for any get together when I don't know what to make or like a little meeting that I have to go to and we're all taking something. I always just make chocolate covered strawberries. I've been making them since I was about eight years old. When I was young, my uncle and I said, we're gonna go into business um, selling and delivering chocolate covered strawberries in a little red Volkswagen Beetle that looked like a strawberry. Um, that never happened, but I definitely didn't lose my passion for making chocolate covered strawberries. And it seems like it's something super, super simple, but uh, I went to a friend's house and that's I took some and she said, oh my gosh, you made these, they look so pretty. She said, look at the ones I just made. And it literally just looked like a blob of lumpy chocolate on the strawberry. So I said, oh, weird. I didn't realize it could go, you know, making chocolate covered strawberries could go so wrong. So I'm going to show you some of my tips on making chocolate covered strawberries and how to make them look festive. Um, but we're going to start with our hibiscus syrup. So let me get the ingredients for my hibiscus syrup. I'm going to move some of them out of the way. Hibiscus syrup is a great recipe to know how to make because it's 
It goes really well in cocktails. You can use it to make a quick agua fresca if you just add it to water. You can also make your own gourmet hibiscus soda if you have a soda stream or if you just have plain sparkling water and you wanna add a little bit of flavor to it, you can add a tablespoon of the hibiscus syrup to it and it'll um, step it up a notch and you don't have to buy those little syrups that come with the soda stream because you once you learn how to make one type of syrup, you can make a lot of different ones with the same type of um, idea with time, same format. So what you need for this recipe is sugar. I like to use pure cane sugar, but any granulated sugar works. Hibiscus flowers, dry hibiscus, and what? So the, the proportions that I use are uh, one to one. And then, so it's two cups of sugar, two cups of water, and then one cup of hibiscus flowers. And if well, you want, do you have a preference for the type of sugar, white, azúcar morena? Oh, oh, because it's just less processed. You can see it's not as white as other sugars that you can get in the store. So I do, I just prefer to use a less processed sugar. And I get this one, they have the pure organic cane sugar at Costco in a, in a five pound bag. And it's a pretty good price compared to the smaller bags at the grocery stores. So for simple syrup, you want it to be a one-to-one -one ratio. Unless you want it to be really thick, then you're gonna do two cups of sugar, one cup of water, but it's gonna be a lot thicker. This to me is the perfect, like for drinks, um, the perfect consistency. And then the, the hibiscus flowers, for anyone who's never tasted hibiscus flowers uh, or hibiscus, it's kind of like a tart, almost like a cranberry juice, sweet tart when you add the sugar to it. So the syrup just is really versatile and pairs well with a lot of different things. You can even add it to your lemonade or to your limeade. I have a recipe on my website that I call the Mexican Arnold Palmer, which I make the Mexican limeade with the little key limes. And then I make hibiscus, uh, hibiscus tea and I mix those together and it's really good. So you're gonna need your sugar, your hibiscus, your flowers. Some of the tools you're gonna need, a small saucepan or pot, whatever they're called, a spoon, and then, for the last steps, you're gonna need something to strain your syrup into. And this is something that I didn't realize not that many people have on hand, but I use this almost daily, a fine mesh strainer. And if you're gonna bottle them, the syrup so it looks cute, you can use a little funnel so it doesn't get all over the place. Or you can just put it into something like this, like a mason jar, and it still looks pretty and keeps well in the refrigerator. And it keeps for, I mean, at least a month, probably even a month or two because of the sugar. That's what keeps it preserved in the refrigerator. So I'm going to go ahead and pour in my two cups of water, my two cups of sugar. And it seems like kind of a lot, but it ends up cooking down and you end up with about, about, about 16 ounces, which isn't that much. You can either give a big bottle to someone or two smaller bottles if you go with that ratio. And I put my flowers in at the same time. And then we're gonna let that come to a boil. This doesn't take, it doesn't have any real prep time because you don't have to prepare any ingredients, chop or anything. Just drop it in the pot, drop it like it's hot. And then you're gonna bring it to a boil, which is gonna take a few minutes. And once it comes to a boil, you set your timer for 10 minutes and just stir it occasionally so that you make sure the, the sugar is dissolving and not sticking. And then after 10 minutes, I cover it and let it cool. And then that's when you strain it and it's pretty much ready. But you'll notice that it starts to thicken once it cools. So it's a little bit, uh, it's gonna look a little bit runny when you strain it and you're gonna think, oh wait, this doesn't feel like a syrup texture. But once it cools, it definitely um, thickens up. So we're gonna let that come to a boil and Elise is gonna just, over a few fun facts about hibiscus. Before we get into fun facts, we did already have a question around where can you find hibiscus? Hibiscus, oh gosh, that's a good question. I have to get mine, I have to drive into Denver to the Mexican grocery stores. So if you live anywhere that has the Mexican grocery stores, it, it's typically sold near where they have the dry chiles, the tamarindo, um, uh, all of the dry Mexican ingredients. I've never seen it at a regular mainstream grocery store, or you can find it online, but most Mexican grocery stores or Latin grocery stores should carry it. Thank you. 
And if you live near San Diego, when I used to live in San Diego, I used to just hop the border and get it at the Mercado de Tijuana. But I usually, I stock up on it because I'll buy several pounds, which is pretty big bag holes because I don't like to go to the store just to get one ingredient. Um, and it keeps really well. This one that I'm using, I've actually had it for quite a long time, but I keep it in a sealed container. Um, and it does change color a little bit. It's not as vibrant red when it's older, but it still has the same flavor and it still is, I mean, it's still really, um, really good and really flavorful. Very cool. Thank you, Comadre Nidia, for dropping some info into the chat around Amazon where you can find it. And Comadre Linda for letting us know that Caribbean stores also hold, carry that type of thing or African markets. That's helpful, especially when it's hard to find. Yes. And there's actually a reason why. Um, it, so the the yeah. fun fact uh -huh. is that hibiscus is native to West Africa. So that's fun fact number one. And we know that it goes by a lot of different names, including Flor de Jamaica, hibiscus, Sabdarifa, Rosel, Jamaican Sorel. So it's known by a lot of different names. And just a fun fact on why it's called the Flor de Jamaica in Mexico. In Spanish, hibiscus is often called Jamaica because it's associated with the country of Jamaica, where it's now cultivated and culturally significant. Thought that was really interesting. Yeah, I never gave it any thought of why it's called Flor de Jamaica. And then I thought someone's going to ask why it's called Flor de Jamaica in the class and I'm not going to know. So I researched it. And then then I thought, duh, it's if the flower is native to West Africa, obviously it made its way here to the Americas. Yeah. And then, yeah, then it just became cultivated and is widely used, similar to the way it's used in Mexico to make juices and stuff like that. Um, so I thought that was really really interesting and then it ended up keeping its name similar to I was just doing research on uh, Chile Japones and I thought is this an Asian Chile or I, I was confused because I thought all Chiles were native to Mexico and yes they are native to Mexico but because it was so popular in Asian cooking then it just kept the name Chile Japones even though it's a Mexican Chile so mm -hmm. but and Florida is actually grown in Oaxaca now, I mean, it's grown in different areas, not just Africa and not just Jamaica. So I've seen it. Uh, one of my good friends sent me pictures of where it's cultivated in Oaxaca. It's so pretty and how they have to dry it. And I saw the fresh flowers when I was in Panama and they're just like a really vibrant red mm -hmm. and they like the really plump. They almost look like candies. They're real, the, the petals are really thick. Um, but yeah, I wasn't I wasn't aware that it grew in so many different places. Yeah, interesting. And then apart from teas and beverages, hibiscus is used in various cuisines. Its petals can be incorporated into salads, jams, desserts, offering a unique tartness and vibrant color. Well, I know you have a recipe or you've cooked this. Actually, I don't know if you have it online as a taco filling too, correct? Yes. So what I do with they're, it's a little sweet if you use these flowers because this is a syrup, but if I make my agua de jamaica, you can still use these too. But when I make agua de jamaica, I typically, um, when I strain out the flowers, I'll chop them up, excuse me, and then I'll saute them with onion and garlic. And that makes a really good vegetarian feeling for taquitos, tacos, you can add it to quesadillas. I, add, I saute it in olive oil and sprinkle a little bit of salt. So it's kind of sweet and tart. And if you never tasted the hibiscus flower when it's rehydrated, it tastes a little bit like, um, like kind of like a dried cranberry. So it adds really good flavor to salads and to a lot of different uh, top like fillings. I have a, a tostada recipe. I made it actually for a cooking class called Cooking with Flowers, where everything was uh, made with hibiscus. And it was the tostada, and I layered it with a really flavorful uh, uh frijoles, refried beans, black beans, and then top that with the hibiscus mixture and then a bunch of fresh toppings, avocado and salsa, and it's, it's really good. And I think that's especially like fun for people who are gluten-free and vegan, because sometimes the food can be a little bland, right? But you can spice things up with like jamaica and the tortilla, the fresh toppings, all of that. Yeah, and without using fake packaged 
ingredients that are tailored toward gluten-free or vegan or vegetarian mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, real ingredients in, in recipes like that. Yeah, so we had a quick question in the chat about if you know if the taste of the hibiscus is the same no matter where it's grown. Uh, I see, I've only had hibiscus, I've only seen hibiscus when I go to the mercados in Tijuana or in Mexico, they'll have one that looks really vibrant red and then one that looks like a darker burgundy. And I always just get the brighter one because I purchased the darker one and my agua de Jamaica looks more of like a brownish burgundy and the flavor is the same, but I just, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I haven't come across ones that taste different, but I've just seen the color variation. And I don't know if it's that one's from a different place or if it's older and that's why it looks that color. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I always look for um, the more vibrant colored ones, but sometimes you have no options. And at the stores, I mean, you get what you get, but I've been fortunate. The, the Jamaica that they have here in Colorado has been really pretty. I don't know if you can see in this camera, the, the syrup is boiling and I let it come to a strong boil. I already set my timer for the full 10 minutes to make sure that that flavor is really, really infused into this. And this is a recipe that you can replicate for pretty much anything. If you wanna make a strawberry syrup, you can boil strawberries if you want to make a blueberry syrup. You boil the blueberries with your sugar. And then you. I sometimes will mash it up, but then I strain it so that it's a syrup and it's not like a thicker jam consistency. But yeah, you can just make so many spins on this. Raspberries, peaches. I Sometimes if I have peaches that are going to go bad, I'll do this and I'll add that syrup to my iced tea. Really good. So for people who haven't made a simple syrup before, what would you say is the right consistency once it's cool? The consistency should be similar to a, okay, so if you've seen, I don't know, because it depends. If you buy a maple syrup, it depends on the maple syrup though, because some are a little bit more watery. It's not as thick, hmm, let me see. Like it's, honey? No, it's not as thick as honey. That's a good comparison. It's a little bit more runny than honey. Yes. But if you want it thick like honey, that's that's the point. When I was saying to use uh, one, one cup of water to two cups of sugar, then it'll come out thick like honey. Or if you just keep cooking it longer, like 20 minutes, it'll get thicker also, and it'll be more like honey. And some people, you can use that if you're if you want it to top your ice cream or desserts like that. But for cocktails, I think it's better to have it a little bit more runny because it mixes in a little bit quicker. But yes. And I don't know if you mentioned this, Lola. I think it's a really great addition to champagne. Like it's a fun <laughs> twist on mimosas. That. Yes. It makes really, really pretty mimosas. I fill up the champagne flute, add a tablespoon of simple syrup, of the hibiscus syrup, and then I'll add one raspberry and then one of the little flowers. And it just looks really festive and very pretty. Yes. So and, I was um, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, I my assumption is that everybody knows what simple syrup is, but not everybody does. That's it's a great way to add sweetener to to any sort of drinks that you're making. And like I said, just a one to one ratio. One cup, if you just want a small amount, one cup of sugar to one cup of water, that's a simple syrup. And then you can infuse it like what we're doing right now. And I was going to say, um, you and I were talking last week and I was stumped on what to get some of my colleagues for a Christmas gift. So what we came up with was the little mini Prosecco bottles with a really cute bottled simple syrup so people can make it at home. Yes. So what I did here, just to show you a little bit about packaging, because I think el amor entra por los ojos. Sometimes you fall in love with something just from seeing it, even if you haven't tasted it. So these are actually little recycled bottles that I got from my friend. My friend drinks these little chocolate martini. I guess these are ready-made chocolate martini drinks. The label was super easy to peel off, but I thought they were the perfect size for simple syrup. Um, and if you have other bottles that have labels that are hard to take off, all you have to do is get this, it's this solution called Goo Gone. It's like an orange bottle, um, an orange solution and you can spray it on. And then I found that the best way to take off the labels is with, um, a paper towel. If you get the paper towel uh, 
I don't know, something about the texture of it, it just scrubs right off. So first I soak it to make sure whatever I can get off get, comes off in, in the water, and then I scrub the rest of the label off. So for this one, I just had a little piece of baker's twine, which I bought this big pool, and I think if you just get any kind of baker's twine, it makes anything look really pretty. So I put baker's twine, and then I put a little handmade ornament on this one. And for this one, I just put twine and a, a little um, tag where you can put what it is, or you can put to who it's for. And you could even put, you know, best by whatever date, a month from now or a month and a half from now. Um, but just quick wait. And then these are the bottles that I typically use here at home. You can get these online or at World Market. I think these are really pretty too for gifting. That's what we're gonna use to strain ours. And another option, I actually, I saved my bottles like this, the glass ones, like the honest tea bottles or the kombucha bottles, because they're glass, the label typically come off pretty easily if you peel them off slowly. And then um, you can just reseal them. And they're great because they're glass for, uh, for different syrups also. Quick question on the simple syrup. Do you have to refrigerate it? And second question in the chat, where did you find the twine? Where did I find the what? Twine. Oh, the simple syrup. Uh, yes, it does have to be refrigerated. And the twine, I got this actually at Marshall's. I think it was, uh, yeah, a big pool. But Target actually has a three pack where it's three different colors right now. So you can find it at Target, at Marshall's, at craft stores. Yeah, I always have twine on hand for packing because it just makes everything look really cute. Okay, so our syrup is just about done. It just needs about two more minutes. And I started with this one because it needs time to cool before we strain it. We can give another fun fact on Jamaica. Hibiscus flowers have been traditionally used as a natural dye. The pigments from the petals can create shades of pink, red, and purple. I love that color. And then it can also be used in medicinal traditions. In traditional medicine, hibiscus is believed to have various health benefits. It's often consumed for its potential to support heart health, boost the immune system, and even aid in weight management. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a natural diuretic. And I'm positive that the way we drink it or the way it's prepared in Mexico, we're probably not getting all of the benefits because it's loaded with so much sugar. Um, but in its original form, which I've started drinking it, the hibiscus tea without sugar recently, because there's a restaurant out here that makes it with absolutely no sugar. And I thought, oh, it's not going to be good with no sugar. I need at least a little bit, but it's really, really good and hydrating. Um, and that's when you're really getting the benefits of the antioxidants, the diuretic, like everything that's good for you in hibiscus when you're not just overloading it with sugar. Like we're doing, I mean, this is for a syrup, so it's for a festive occasion. Um, but yeah. Okay, so the timer went off. All I do now when I'm making a syrup is cover it and get it out of the heat and let it come cool down a little bit so that we can strain it, which is our next step. But we'll do that after. Um, after we work on some of our other recipes when it cools down a bit. So the next recipe I am going to start with is the chocolate covered strawberries because I think this is one that anyone can make at home with strawberries and chocolate pretty much. That's all you need. I use a smaller saucepan and a double, uh, if you've ever heard of the term double boiler and had no clue what that meant, which that was me, um, a few you know years ago when I didn't know how to use this. It's a smaller pan. Here's one example of a double boiler that, boiler that you can buy. So it's water underneath, and then this pan with a thin bottom that fits perfectly into the bottom pan. But you can also, you don't have to go out and buy something like this because you can make one. I'm gonna turn on this little pot and get my strawberries. If you have a glass bowl, this also works as a double boiler because it fits perfectly into here. So just look around your kitchen and find one that works in a pot, even if it's a bigger pot and a bigger bowl. Um, that's essentially a, a home, like a makeshift double boiler. 
I'm gonna pour some chocolate. I've been really liking the Ghirardelli's melting wafers, dark chocolate. They have it, it comes in milk chocolate and white chocolate. And it melts pretty quickly and very, very, it's very smooth. So you're gonna need the chocolate in here and a spatula for stirring. I like to use a rubber one so that I can get all of the edges of the chocolate off. You start, even if you have to do this the night before, rinse your strawberries and make sure they're very well dried because any traces of water can, can kind of mess up your chocolate. If you put water in this chocolate, it's gonna seize up and get chunky and it, you can't really work back from that. So I have this on a medium flame and it should start melting in about two to three minutes. And right now the strawberries, I was not very impressed from the store. I don't know if this is in general, they're not that pretty right now, or if it's just, they are in season year. I know they grow in California year round, um, but there's different different times where they're a little prettier than, than other times. And fun fact about strawberries, strawberries are actually loaded with vitamin C. I, I can't remember the stats, but I believe they have more vitamin C than uh, oranges. And for anyone who is watching their sugar intake, vitamin uh, strawberries are, because they have a low glycemic index, they are more diabetic friendly than other fruits because they don't, you know, they don't spike your blood like other fruits would, your blood sugar. So question to the audience, what are some treats that you have taken to events or holiday parties or family gatherings that people have really enjoyed? I'd love to know. Or what's like your signature dish, treat, dessert that people love? So Lola, we're getting some messages in the chat. We're seeing guava jam homemade. That sounds delicious. Cajeta empanadas. Wow. No, no. I think you're going to have to drop the recipe in the chat for that one. I love cajeta empanadas. Mm -hmm. I recently just start, learned to make candy apples, the red candy apples. I feel like those are nostalgic and kind of old fashioned. And out here in Colorado, they, it's all over the country, the Rocky Mountain Chocolate Factory um, that sells candy apples, but they don't have the red ones here. So I, I began making them and it's very easy ingredients, very easy to make. It just takes time to bring it to the boil, a boil and to the temperature necessary for it to turn into the hard candy once you dip the apples in it. But that's been one of my, I've been giving that as gifts to a lot of people. They're so pretty and festive too. Ooh, Denver pen woman wrote rosettes. And if you are comfortable coming off mute and letting us know what that is, that sounds, sounds like it's a beautiful dessert. Yeah, what are rosettes? We want to know. Mm -hmm. Eva wrote mousse de parchita maracuya, marquesa de limón. Oh my gosh. Wait, mousse de qué? What was it? Parchita maracuya. Mm. And a Marquesa de Limón. Mm, sounds delicious. Yeah. So, Lola, as you're mixing that chocolate, I know it's really easy to burn. How do you avoid burning it? I That's why I make mine in a double boiler, because I've never had that problem when I cook it in this. It almost... Almost like the baño maria that makes sure your flan cooks evenly and doesn't scorch on the bottom. This is the same concept because I, when I used to make the the melted chocolate many many years ago in the microwave, I used to be able to make it sometimes and it would be perfect. And then other times it would just turn into chunky chocolate and it was I couldn't use it anymore. So once I learned this method, I, I've never. It doesn't burn. I think the, the fact that we have water in between and it's not directly in the heat and it's not getting zapped in the microwave where you don't know how hot it's actually getting. Um, this method just does prevent um, does prevent the burning. I haven't had that problem since I started using the double boiler. 
And yeah, the microwave method is hit or miss. I know a lot of people make their strawberries or they melt their chocolate in the microwave, but I just feel like mine is a little wonky and I never know how hot it's actually getting. And even if it says do it in 30 second increments, 30 seconds can burn your chocolate like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We got a question on um, the strawberries themselves. How long should strawberries last once you get them home from the store? Once you get them home from the store, I always find that I have to finish mine within about four to five days, not even a full week. I don't wash them until I'm going to eat them. And when, or the night before, I'm going to pack them for the kids or eat them myself. And I like to store them either in a big wide mouth mason jar or in a glass container with a lid. I, I feel that it lasts, they last longer in glass for some reason. Um, mm. and, and if you don't have time to let them dry completely after rinsing them, put a paper towel in that container. Don't take off the tops until you're ready to eat them. Um, yeah. And yeah, they don't last really more than four to five days before you start seeing some get a little bit fuzzy. And so, and if you feel that you're not going to finish them in that the amount of time, I mean, if you have too many, I will freeze them. I'll put them on a baking sheet like this, exactly like this, actually. Um, I'll take off the tops, though, after they're rinsed. Put them on here separately, because if you put them in a bag, they're going to clump together, and then it's going to be hard to use them in smoothies or however you want to use them. But if you store them and freeze them like this and then put them in a bag, then they're easy to just break apart from that, from those clusters. Okay, so you see, it goes from little chips to melted completely in a matter of minutes, like, it kind of took a long time to get here, but now that it started to melt, it's perfect. So this, Quick question on your tool, Lola. I noticed you used a wooden spoon for the syrup and now you switched to a rubber spatula. Yes, I use a wooden spoon for almost everything, but for the strawberries and for scraping down, because the wood doesn't, I have wooden spatulas also, but because they don't bend, they don't scrape off all the chocolate around the ends. So that's why I like to use rubber for this. Um, because once it starts getting close to the end, I need to make it a little bit deeper. I, I mean, the chocolate's not as deep, so I will scoop it to a little corner and then um, use this, uh, use that to dip my strawberries. I've seen a lot of recipes where they put sticks into the strawberries, but I feel like any sort of puncturing, any sort of opening in the strawberry makes them start to go bad quicker. So I like to just hold it by the, the green dip it in quickly. And I'm gonna just do a few that are just chocolate. You let it drip off a little and then put it directly on here. And then I'm gonna also make a few with some of the little festive toppings. So let's see if you can see these I have. A little closer, please. To which camera, this one? That one, yeah. So I have some red and white little toppings, some red, white, and ah, can't see what I'm showing you. Red, white, and green. I have some just regular, this you can find at Target or at the grocery store, really coarse sparkling sugar, but it's used in the baking section. It's not regular sugar, but it's called sparkling. And then these little um, gingerbread men and snowflakes. I don't like to add the big chunky ones that much because they kind of give the, it's too much crunch and texture, but just a few add, add a little festive vibe to the strawberries. And you have to work quick while the chocolate's hot. I just put it on the lowest flame so it stays warm. And then from here, you can sprinkle on some of your toppings. I'll show you some. Mm. And for people who don't have Silipat mats, what's an alternative that they can use to like place the strawberries on so they can cool? I like to use parchment paper or wax paper also works. You have to, have to, have to use something. And I learned this recently. I don't know how I made this rookie mistake. I was just in a rush. I had extra chocolate from something. I had made something with melted chocolate and then I wanted to just use this strawberries that I had or the chocolate. So I just got out the strawberries and started dipping them quickly before it got hard. And I put it directly onto a plate. And then I quickly realized when I wanted to eat one that when you do this, the strawberries stick, the whole bottom part stuck to the plate. So half of my chocolate was completely stuck. Here's someone, here's a little. 
My favorite sugar though is this big sparkly one. You can you can bedazzle them for birthday parties for for the kids um, Halloween party. I made them with little uh, edible eyeballs, um, so they look like little monsters. They're really cute. Cute. For my cut, my cousin just had a season. Her bridal shower and the theme was like black and burgundy, and her sister made white chocolate covered strawberries with little black sugar on it. They looked really pretty. Cute. What about tips for making sure to get enough chocolate off so it doesn't like pool on the bottom? Um, usually just a few, about three little taps gets off as much as you need to get off because you'll see this is the first one that we made and it doesn't have too much on the bottom. It just gets flat and they're all going to get flat like that because you're laying them um, on a mat. So I just shake it for about a few seconds and then that's typically enough. And another, another thing that I do, if you don't have any of the sparkles or any of that, you can also just melt a little bit more chocolate or put it into, or actually get it with a fork. I've seen where they put it in a little, little tiny bags and squirt it to make the little stripes, but I usually will get a fork and scoop some and then just um, shake it over the strawberries to create like cute texture too. And I'll usually use, oh, this one's bad. I'll usually use white, uh, white chocolate. So it contrasts with the darker chocolate. And you just kind of swirl it so that you make sure you get chocolate on the tops too. So I don't know if you're able to see the text of the chocolate, how smooth it is. No chunks at all. No. But about how long does it take for those to cool? This, the first one is cool. So it takes about three minutes. That's why when you're, if you're gonna add any sort of decorations, you have to do it immediately because the chocolate will get hard and then the, the little things won't stick anymore. So, and I like to do, to, to add the toppings in over the bowl because then if, if you're sprinkling it over the strawberries, you're gonna get sprinkles everywhere. If you are um, dipping it, then you're gonna get chocolate. But if you bring the strawberry and then sprinkle it on top, then you, you can still reuse whatever's left in the bowl after. Another have you tip. ever injected them with anything? No, but I've seen more people inject them with champagne, actually. And that's Grand Marnier. Marnier. I've seen oh, that. Grand Marnier, yes, that's what it is. You're right. Mm -hmm. I imagine probably like a syringe or something yeah. like that, right? Yes, with a little syringe. I'm sure that would be easy to do. Yeah. yeah. Be good, too. And about how long would you say these keep for? Like once they harden... When should they be eaten? Within 24 hours. I don't even like to make them the night before to give the next day. I would make them the day of if you're gifting them that day, because you'll notice even by the morning, the um, a little bit of condensation starts to come out from the bottom. So if you're another tip, if you have strawberries that have bruises, if they have any little imperfections, just know that the strawberry will bring out the chocolate will bring out those imperfections even more. So you don't want to try to like get away with hiding things um, just to, because you're not going to see it with the chocolate, just get, use those strawberries for something else because they're, they're going to go bad a lot quicker once you put the chocolate on them. So tw within 24 hours, but make them the day of, I mean, they're relatively quick to make. So if you're taking them to a party, I would say, don't try to make them the night before, just make them that day. This technique looks pretty transferable, versatile, however you want to say it. Do you dip anything else? Uh, my favorite, my well, you can dip bananas the same way and freeze them. You can also dip, um, I do this, but I do this with the very last bit of my chocolate because I love pineapples, uh, chocolate covered pineapples, but because pineapples are so moist, they mess the chocolate up once you start dipping. So if I just have a little bit left, I just get my chunks of, I'll do like, half of a spear at a time. And I just scoop as much as I can and slap it on a little bit so it's a little even and then put it on the mat. And those are not to give away because they never look pretty. Um, so I don't know, I know Disney sells chocolate covered pineapple spears and I have no idea. They must do it in a big, you know, in a, they, they probably have a big thing of chocolate and they just hold the spear over it because if they were to dip that in the chocolate, the whole pot of chocolate would go bad, not go bad, but it would seize up and get hard. 
But yeah, those are the main. Oh, the other, I, this is another one I forget. And I love so much chocolate covered cherries, but not the maraschino, the real, real fruit cherries. Oh my gosh, they're so, so good dipped in dark chocolate. I, that's one of my other favorites. And I usually will get, no, I just do one at a time actually, or two at a time because they look cute when they're stuck together. You bring up a good point. What other types of chocolate can you use? You can use milk chocolate, white chocolate. I mean, the grocery stores and Michael's, they, they sell a lot of the chocolate, uh, I forget, the little wafers. Mm -hmm. that are different colors but you can also add color by using gel uh gel food coloring but you can use chocolate chips um the baking if if, if you've seen the big chocolate well, i don't know what it's called the bar of not not a bar of chocolate it's a like bark yeah the big bark big baker's chocolate bark um so the tablets the wafer these are the wafers where you see them and they're in a little tiny, they look like little coins. Then you'll find the big bark that you have to cut into big chunks, that almost like big brownie chunks. And then the chocolate chips, that's another option too. So I didn't even need the full bag and it wasn't a big bag, it's a 10 pound, 10 ounce bag to make this many strawberries. So a little bit of chocolate goes a long way and you can see, I'm just gonna show you a few of the examples. This one has the sugar. This one has the sparkle. This one if you can put them a little closer to the camera where you can see the ingredients, we can see some more of the detail. Thank you. You see that? Beautiful. Yeah. But you could put for the kids' birthdays, I'll usually use like a confetti colored strawberries. Um, and like I said, little googly eyes for Halloween. You can just make these however you really, decorate them however you really want. Here's this, I'm gonna get this out of the way. Bring them back in a bit on a plate. And just so you know, we're at about 542 um, Pacific Standard Time. So we have about 20 minutes. minutes left. Oh, shoot. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to, this is already, I already had this double boiler on in the back so that the water is hot. The next recipes we're going to make are the haystacks. And they require the same ingredients, chocolate, marshmallows, and then something crunchy. So like I showed you before, I think I'm gonna only make, hmm. Let's see, you, you guys, I'm gonna make both of them tonight, but we'll make one for this class because I have to take some stuff to my kids' school tomorrow. Um, just if we ha can have a vote, do you want me to make them with the cinnamon toast crunch cereal and the dark chocolate wafers or the chow mein noodles, which is the original recipe that I learned from my suegra, and I didn't even know what these were until she showed them to me. Um, and then these are made with regular, oh, that, I forgot to mention, you can use chocolate chips. Did I say that? So these are semi-sweet chocolate chips. Which which ones do you prefer? Cinnamon Toast Crunch or chow mein? Participants, feel free to drop it in the chat. Now, what are you thinking, Elisa and Maria? Cinnamon toast is a quick vote. Okay, perfect. I'm gonna drop in this chocolate. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna use the same burner as, because I'm using the same chocolate as for my strawberries. And so this is still warm. And I'm just gonna drop in these little wafers. So here's what I use when I don't have a silicone mat. I just use parchment paper and sometimes it curls up at the end. So I, I'll just, Scrunch it together like this, and then it lays a little bit better. But if you have wax paper, wax paper also works. Okay. So well, as we're setting that up, I'll give a fun fact on chocolate. This is from the Whitaker Chocolate Makers. Origins of chocolate date back to Mesoamerican civilizations, and the word chocolate comes from. Chocolatl. So remember those little tips because we'll be dropping some trivia questions in just a few. Okie doke. So this is the setup. We're going to be using not that, not that. Our marshmallows, our cinnamon toast crunch, 
And while that is, while this chocolate is starting to melt, I want to show you how I strain out my syrup so that we can bottle it. Okay, where is my, oh, here it is. This is, so you saw it took 10 minutes to boil, a few minutes to cool down. I'd probably let it cool a little longer if I had more time, but it's not gonna affect flavor or anything. And then just get my pot, put it right over the mesh sieve. And I've even seen a more concentrated syrup where they sell just the hibiscus flowers in it in a small jar. I think it was like $15 just for that little jar of flowers in, in the concentrated syrup. And it says they sell it as like um, blooming hibiscus flowers for champagne. You just drop it in the champagne and it kind of opens up a little more. So you can also do that with your flowers. And then... Here's my Lola, we had a quick question on the difference between wax paper and parchment paper, which I think is a really good question. Okay, just so you know, wax paper cannot go in the oven. Just think wax melts. Do not put it in the oven. Do not use it for things that are like hot. I mean, this is going to be hot, but it's not going to, I would use parchment. I use parchment paper a lot more than I use wax paper, but mm -hmm. wax paper is great for if this recipe that we're going to make with the s'mores clusters, you can freeze it, so you can freeze them, but I, and I like to put wax paper, but if I have parchment paper, I'll use whatever I have in between, <laughs> excuse me, the layers. And then I also put it on top so that it doesn't get, they don't get frostbite. So wax paper is more for me for separating and like cool spaces and then parchment papers for everything else and heating. So I always use a, a funnel when I'm putting it into a glass like this little funnel and then just, you'll see it made two cups, like I said, 16 ounces. Pour it in. And like Elise said, this is gonna be such a cute little gift with a bottle of champagne. And I also thought you can do cocktail napkins or I have little, cock these are appetizer toothpicks that I just got in the little holiday themed ones with uh, gifts and candles and Christmas trees. And these look really cute if you have your glass, your cocktail made, and then you have whatever garnishes and then you just lay these on top. So that would be a, another way to bedazzle your gift or something to pair with your syrup. If you're not gonna give the bottle of champagne, you could just give little cocktail toothpicks. I think it's also cute to print out the recipe for the person and add that. So here's how I would, I would let it cool before I cover it and bottle, um, and refrigerate it. Always wipe down the bottle because it's gonna be, it might get a little sticky. And then you can just put, like I said earlier, a little bow or the little twine or an ornament or a sticker for your company logo, whatever you, whatever you wanna add to it. Okay, so here's our syrup. You saw a 10 minute simple syrup, super easy. And then I'm gonna, okay, our chocolate is getting nice and melted. Eileen, you had a question on, do you have any presentation recommendations for gifting? And just wanted to make sure that your question was covered with how she showed us the little bottles. One other thing, yeah, I have a few ideas. Well, cause this is still melting. So another idea for pre presenting. So like I said, I always use twine and I always, because I have, I have my online shop, I always have packing paper, which is brown and it doesn't look that cute, but when you put a really pretty bow on it, it dazzles it out. So you can use twine or ribbon. I always save ribbon when I get it from on gifts and packages, like cuter ribbon, kind of like this, not just um, paper. Um, so I, like if I were to be gifting the little ch chocolate clusters that we're making right now, I would put it in something like this. Or if you if you have to do a lot and gift a lot, I would these you can find at the dollar stores. I would just put a few in here, maybe four to six. And then again, I would tie it with twine. Or another option is these cute little 
boxes. I think I got these at the dollar store too, or one of those types of stores. And you could just put two if it's just like a really tiny token gift. Um, but yeah, so I think those are some of the really easy options. I, I remember um, seeing gifts even wrapped in the, uh, what is it called? The newspaper with the little cartoons on it. Um, and I thought that looked really cute. What about in a tin can? We had that question come in. Yes, yes, a tin can. The one thing for all of these is you have to let them cool completely before you refrigerate this and the syrup does need to be refrigerated. So just, I mean, keep it in your fridge till you're ready to gift it. You can make it, you know, well in advance. Um, but yes, I just had a little tin in my basement that I thought would be cute for these chocolates. I mean, anything really. Right now they sell all those cute little uh, holiday containers for edible gifts and stuff. But yeah, I think <laughs> these are just a few options. But to even, I feel like the chocolates would even look really pretty in something like this. Because you could stack a few on top of each other and they would look really pretty and gourmet. Okay, so this chocolate is almost, it's just about ready. I'm gonna keep it on while I prepare the other two ingredients, which are our marshmallows. This is as simple as it gets. Marshmallows and the cereal. And believe it or not, the, I know the chow mein noodles sound really weird, but they're so, so good in this recipe. No, we had, um, who was it? Let me see. Denver Pen Woman says she makes haystacks with peanut butter and butterscotch chips with the chow mein noodles. That sounds like a really good twist. Ooh, butterscotch. Okay, but it's it's oh, the no. little butterscotch, like tiny little broken chips. No, no they're like the little chocolate chips, but they're oh, in the package. Yes, the butterscotch yes. chips. That sounds delectable. It's me. Also, here's the rosette iron. If anybody hasn't seen rosettes. If anybody could see my buñuelos, they call them buñuelos too, right? Right. Buñuelos de aire. Yes. Right, oh, and they they awesome. they make them big. I haven't seen the big um irons, but here's some other irons. Yeah. Um, butterfly and beautiful. Like, you can fill one with like little jellies, or I haven't ever tried the other. I've tried butterflies and these flowers, so. Uh, then you can sprinkle the sugars inside them. Oh, you have to have a, a, a comadrazo where you show us, show us how to make them, comadre. I know. <laughs> okay, so the idea is nice and melted. What I did in this bowl is I mixed together the marshmallows just so that it's evenly distributed with the cereal. And then I'm going to get my glove because this is going to be hot. And a little dish towel. And I once also made the mistake of, I used this double boiler and I just put my marshmallows and cereal into it to mix it. The pot's too hot, so it melted everything. That was a disaster. Everything just got gooey. So now I'm gonna drop this into here, which yes, it's hot, but it's not as hot as the pot. Hmm. And then for this, I used a little over 12 ounces of chocolate, which my recipe actually calls for 24 ounces, but I still had some of that left over. So I used what I had in there. And then you're gonna mix it really well. And at least can drop the links to the recipes in the chat, but I think you'll also get them from the comadres. And they were dropped in at the beginning of our call. Perfect. For the recipe for chocolate covered strawberries, though, that one individuals will have to watch the video because that's not on your website. Yeah, that's just the technique of melting it properly in the double boiler, I would say. So I'm going to just get this last tiny bit of chocolate. And you want to make sure everything is well coated so that you don't see the marshmallows or the cereal popping out. I never, when I saw these, I could not wrap my head around how they were made and how they were in these little clusters. And then I realized once I made, oh my gosh, I can't believe I didn't think of this. So it's just, this is the mixture. And then what you, the, the 
main step is to get your spoon. I like to make them in smaller clusters and just kind of mount them up and they will stick together because of the chocolate. So I'm getting about a, between a teaspoon and a tablespoon at a time. Make sure you get a little bit of everything. And just, they these should get hard in about mm, 15, min, 15 minutes, if not sooner. And they're ready to get once they're dry. You don't have to refrigerate them. If you're going to, if you, these you can make in advance and actually freeze them, like I said, in layers and with wax paper or parchment paper in between cover. And then once you're ready to eat them, they're actually kind of good frozen too. Um, you can bust them out and either let them thaw out or eat them like that. So here is that. I had a question come in about, is this like making chocolate turtles? Yes, I actually, I just realized I have some old recipes on my website and I made little chocolate, <laughs> excuse me, clusters, which I guess you would call them chocolate turtles with um, dulce de leche and the chocolate and then almonds. And I sprinkle them with a uh, coarse sea salt. And I'm like, oh, I guess this is how they make the chocolate turtles too. Yes, exactly. So you could do this with nuts. You could do, do this with nuts and dried fruit. You can really make any variation of this you want, but just same technique, mix it together with your melted chocolate and um, let it let it dry and it's ready. I don't know if you want to ask a few of the trivia yeah. questions so that, because I think we're almost ready to wrap up now. Fun time. So as we wrap up, before we wrap up, what is another name for hibiscus? First answer wins the prize. First correct answer. Okay, this is not part of the trivia. I just, I'm curious to know which of these recipes do you think that you could make or that, which is one, which is the, which recipe would, are you likely to make first? I'd like to know. Ooh. <laughs> and Maria Ferrer, you are our first answer, our first an correct answer. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't mind messaging me privately your email, actually, I think we have hers. Never mind. We'll follow up with you after so you could pick your prize. Thank you. So you can see, let me see, that has two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. It makes at least three dozen, which is um, great because it's, I mean, the hardest part is really melting the chocolate with any of these. The, all of these recipes are kind of similar. The hardest part of the syrup is letting it boil. The hardest part of these is letting the chocolate uh, melt down to the right texture. But then after that, it's just straining or mixing together and then plopping these little clusters onto your nonstick surface. And you have at least uh, over three dozen of these little treats. What if you didn't want all that chocolate? If you didn't want all that chocolate, I would just cut the this, I would use a third of the recipe so that, and then it's still gonna look pretty because then the marshmallows and the cereal will pop out and you'll see more of it. As you can but, see the white, yeah. But you'll be you'd be surprised. It looks really chocolatey because it's a big chunk, but it's just the coating of it. So if you try this this recipe and you find it to be just too empalago, you find that the little uh, chocolate clusters are empalago te empalagan. Just use less chocolate and see how you like that. But I don't think any of these are really good, especially because it's dark chocolate, so they're not overly sweet. Or you can just stick a little white marshmallow on top, you know, as a topping. Yes. Yep. Yeah, haystacks seem to be the resounding winner. There are a lot of people interested in the haystacks. And because they look, the thing is, they look fancy and they're, they're easy and the ingredients are really easy and inexpensive. So you can make a, the, the most expensive part of this recipe is really just the chocolate. 
but they look fancy because they're just little cute clusters that people don't know what to expect. And then they bite into it. Like I did the first time I tasted it. It reminded me of one of my favorite desserts ever, s'mores. So that's why I had to make two different spins on it. How long do they last in the refrigerator? You know what? I don't refrigerate these typically. If I'm going to store them, it's it's on the counter um, and they last oh. I mean, at least over a week. They would last for sure over a week. But if you're not going to eat them right away, I would just recommend um, freezing them or freeze. You can make a big batch and then freeze them. They're always nice just to have in the freezer because when you have guests, unexpected guests, you can just bust them out and you have a fancy little treat to give them. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I would recommend making the full batch and then freezing what you're not going to eat in little uh, containers with a top, with a lid. So yeah, we made at least two dozen on this tray. So I was at a Sweet 16 party a few weeks ago, and they had Rice Krispie treats with the stick stuck in them. And then they dipped them in the white chocolate on the bottom. Oh, I've seen that, yeah. And That's then they wrapped them in like, plas like uh, yeah, plastic wrap. But you uh -huh. know what? If you want to make it easy on yourself and you're not someone that just loves being in the kitchen all day you could even get pre-made rice krispie treats and then put those on a stick and dip them in chocolate uh to make something a little bit more homemade or festive with the sprinkles and stuff oh yeah That's and also awesome. make your own rice krispie i've never been i don't know why my rice krispie treats never come out right so i'm not <laughs> but yeah did you want to ask one more trivia yeah. before this last trivia question let's see who is really paying attention to this one the origins of chocolate date back to what civilization? Which civilization? It starts with an M. <laughs> Should have just gone for the double prize, Maria. <laughs> oh no, somebody else has to win. Okay, so just to show you the end result of this. Yum. But you'll know that they're ready when they're dull. Right now, they're still shiny because they're wet. And then, like I, like I said, you can put, oh, this is too small for these, actually. I wouldn't use these. I would use either a pretty jar or a plastic bag with the twine and a cute little label, a, a little box or a little tin with a festive bow, um, and even... You know, right now at Target, they have all the, the little holiday uh, Rubbermaid containers or the ones oh. that are like, more disposable but reusable. I think those are good because people can reuse them. And they already have the festive uh, decor on the edge, end, so you don't even have to do anything to them. So like I said, essentials for uh, the syrup are the bottles. Save your pretty little bottles because you can put your syrup, syrups in there. You can also... Um, let me see the syrups, this twine is essential. Um, even the jute twine, the one that looks kind of like rope looks really pretty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think those are the save your bows, pretty bows, especially right now when you're unwrapping gifts, ones that you can iron so that they look new again. And yeah, those are some of my gifts. But yeah, this is a, this bow, I actually use it on all my, <laughs> on all my kids gifts. And then I just take it right off after they open it and keep it. <laughs> I think it's so pretty for everything. Oh, and the winner of that last round of questions was Vanessa Wiarco, Mesoamerica. Yay. Mexican was close, but and mid medieval times was kind of close. But it made me <laughs> laugh. It made me laugh more than anything. <laughs> the M, the M. She said we threw them off with that M. And then we had a quick question from Recuerdos Boricua. How long do you need to let them thaw after you freeze them? Great question, actually. Um, Probably about, I would say if you're going to serve them after dinner, probably about 30 to 45 minutes before. I mean, take them out an hour before, but people can definitely bite into them 30 to 45 minutes after. Uh, and they're not, they're not rock hard where they're, um, where you can't eat them if you bite into them, uh, even when they're frozen. They're still totally, I like them frozen, actually. Oh, you won't break you won't break a tooth on them. You're not gonna break your tooth unless you have caps and they're sensitive <laughs> <laughs> or cavities. I mean fillings that might pop out. I know they're good. 
they're still really good at an edible, edible kind of like the york peppermint patterns you know a lot of people like to freeze them it's kind yeah. of like and then I'll close my fun facts out with the smell of chocolate can help relax and reduce stress and improve your mood. So as if you didn't need enough reasons to eat chocolate, oh, especially during the holidays. Yes, I know. I know I was a little tense before this class, but once this chocolate started melting, I felt like I <laughs> was floating. <laughs> no, your kitchen must be smelling terrific. Well, I'm so glad this worked out today because there's a bake sale at my son's school and then they have to take treats for their holiday. Their, tomorrow's their last day of school. I'm like, oh, I'm actually going to take something that's choc with chocolate. So just so that they know, I already have my treats ready for him. But thank you everyone for joining. Hopefully we'll have some a good lineup of classes in 2024. Good night. Yes. Happy holidays, everyone. Thank you for joining in. And many thanks to Lola and Elise for always joining us and having such great, you know, such great presentations. We love it. Thank you. Oh, and anybody who makes this recipe, we want pictures. Yes. If you go on my website, please leave um, comments if you make them. Absolutely. Thank Bye. You. Good night. Happy holidays. Felicidades. <laughs>